This is Biology 2, Part 2 of Chapter 2 of Principles of Ecology. Uh, in this part of the video lecture, we will be taking a look at the flow of energy through an ecosystem, uh, as well as identifying some of the players in food webs and food chains, uh, and also taking a very brief look at how matter cycles through the ecosystem. In our last section, we talked a lot about the biotic factors uh, in an ecosystem, the living parts. Uh, we'll kind of be focusing in on that right now when we talk about the flow of energy through an ecosystem. Remember, all organisms require energy to perform life's functions. That's one of our characteristics of life. Uh, and there's different ways that organisms obtain energy. Uh, we did talk a little bit about these in uh, Biology 1. Remember, autotrophs are organisms that make their own food uh, from either sunlight, that would be through photosynthesis, or chemicals, which would be through a process called chemosynthesis. Autotrophs can also be called producers uh, because they <clears throat> make their uh, own energy. They produce their own energy. Uh, autotrophs in an ecosystem would be uh, the plants, and green algae. Heterotrophs, of course, are everything that isn't a autotroph. Uh, heterotrophs are organisms that get food from consuming other organisms. Um, heterotrophs can do this in different ways. We, of course, have herbivores or the plant eaters. Um, heterotrophs can also be called consumers. And herbivores are often called primary consumers or first level consumers. Carnivores, those are our meat eaters. These are also called uh, second level consumers. <clears throat> and omnivores, omni is a Latin root meaning all. And so omnivores eat both plant and animal material. Most often in an ecosystem, omnivores are considered tertiary uh, or upper level consumers. And detritivores. Uh, detritus in Latin means garbage or waste. So detritivores can also be called scavengers. Uh, they eat dead organic material. Uh, they're kind of the recyclers of the ecosystem. Um, something that would be an example of each uh, an herbivore, of course, we could have any kind of plant eater, a deer, for example. Uh, a carnivore would be something like a wolf. Uh, an omnivore, a great example of omnivores besides people, uh, are bears. Uh, and detritivores, an example of that would be all of the various types of microorganisms or bacteria that uh, live either in the water or in the soil of ecosystems. When we talk about energy moving through the ecosystem, we can describe that in a few different ways. We talk about uh, trophic levels. These are the energy levels, so this is how energy is transferred in an ecosystem. Now there's a couple of ways that we can show this. A food chain is a very simple way to show energy relationships. This is kind of a, a chain of organisms uh, where you can see from the picture here, uh, we have the producer or the autotroph of the plant, uh, the herbivore, that is the grasshopper, the omnivore, that is the mouse, and the carnivore, that is the snake. So the grasshopper eats the plant, the mouse eats the grasshopper, and the snake eats the mouse. Um, it's one example of how energy can be transferred in uh, a particular type of ecosystem. In some cases, ecologists may focus in on uh, one particular food chain. For example, if they were studying uh, the habitat of, of the snake, uh, they would take a look at this food chain. Uh, food chains, just like you know any other chains, if a link is busted, uh, then the, the, chain can't, uh, the chain can't do its job. So if something were to happen, for example, to the grasshoppers, uh, the mouse might suffer for that. And if the mouse population can't get enough grasshoppers, they may not uh, survive in large numbers, which will affect how the snake finds its food. 
A more realistic and complex way to show relationships uh, is a food web, which is basically just taking a bunch of food chains and connecting those together. Uh, here we have an example of a desert food web, uh, although it looks a little odd that all of the organisms are posing nice and pretty for the picture here. Um, this would be kind of every possible combination of different food chains for this particular ecosystem. And so we show with arrows uh, kind of who's eating whom. So the error goes from the uh, prey to the predator. So you can see, for example, the ridge nose rattlesnake has uh, a couple of different uh, links in the chain. Um, it is affected uh, and eats the red spotted toad, uh, the kangaroo rat, as well as that uh, Mexican whiptail lizard. Uh, if something were to happen to just one of those links uh, in the chain, the food web could uh, collapse. So food webs are every possible combination of ways for organisms to get their energy and food chains are showing one particular example. <clears throat> Ecologists model how energy goes through an ecosystem using a pyramid. Uh, so an ecological pyra pyramid uh, is a model to show energy flow through ecosystems uh, and how energy is transferred from the bottom producers all the way to the top consumers. Uh, so we can take a look at different types of ecological pyramids. We can take a look at the pyramid of energy, uh, the pyramid of biomass, or the pyramid of numbers. But however you look at it, a pyramid should have a big fat bottom and a little skinny itty bitty top. Now there's a reason for that. Uh, there's what we call in nature the 10% rule. Every single time the energy level jumps uh, a level up. So for example, from going from the producers to the primary consumers, 90% of the energy that plants get from the sun is used to do plant things. Uh, they grow, they develop, they set their seeds, they bloom, what have you. Only 10% of the energy that the plants got from the sun is available to an herbivore that nibbles on that plant. Now, that herbivore uses 90% of the energy from that plant to do its herbivore thing, its growth, its development, etc. Only <clears throat> then 10% of that energy is released up to the next higher level of consumership. So basically when a heterotroph consumes, it's only getting 10% of the energy available, kind of like the leftover energy that the organism itself doesn't use. So the reason why the pyramid is used in ecology <clears throat> is because in order to have a stable pyramid, you need to have a big fat bottom and a skinny little itty bitty top. Now with the number of <clears throat> primary producers all the way to third level or tertiary consumers. You always have to have more plants, more autotrophs, more producers than you do consumers. Um, so the biomass, the total mass of living matter at each trophic level, you have to have more biomass of the autotrophs than you do of the heterotrophs. When we take a look at how nutrients cycle through the ecosystem, uh, there's a lot of both natural and physical processes in the environment uh, that keep the elements rolling uh, through the <clears throat> uh, different parts of the ecosystem, whether it's the aquatic portions uh, or the terrestrial or land portions. Basically, for these cycles, what you will need to kind of make sure that you highlight uh, are the circled portions of these diagrams that are in your notes. Uh, the water cycle, of course, we've talked about the water cycle in science a lot. Uh, the three most important parts are uh, the precipitation, which is where we have the um, gas falling from a liquid. Evaporation, of course, is the liquid going to a gas. Um, and condensation, which is uh, how we change that gas to a liquid.
transpiration is an important part of the water cycle. Transpiration is the water that plants let go from their leaves uh, during the photosynthesis process. Uh, in areas, for example, in the tropical rainforest where you have lots of trees, uh, that can actually play, play a role in uh, daily weather patterns. Uh, solar energy, of course, is uh, the main driving force of the water cycle. Carbon and oxygen is recycled uh, both in aquatic ecosystems and terrestrial or land-based ecosystems. Uh, we've talked about photosynthesis and respiration. That's the main way that uh, we exchange carbon and oxygen um, between the plant and the animal community. Uh, of course, there is a, an added um, portion to this cycle with the combustion of fossil fuels uh, by us. Uh, that tends to put a little more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, also, because we are carbon-based life forms, uh, when things die, uh, and they get uh, decomposed, we often uh, can get that kind of release of carbon and oxygen back into uh, the cycle as well. Uh, the nitrogen cycle. Uh, the most important part of the nitrogen cycle uh, is from the atmosphere. Um, most of the air that we breathe is actually composed of nitrogen. And there are special little bacteriums that know how to suck the nitrogen directly out of the air. They are the only organisms that can do this on the planet. Uh, so they suck the nitrogen out of the air and they live on the roots of plants. And so they give some of that nitrogen uh, to the plants for their growth. And then of course, uh, Mr. Bunny Rabbit herbivore there comes along, nibbles on the plant, then it gets its nitrogen supply that way. And then uh, Coyote there nibbles on Mr. Rabbit to get the nitrogen from that source. Uh, animal wastes, of course, there's lots of nitrogen in both urine and feces. Um, the decomposers like to take care of that and kind of recycle that back into the soil as well. So this can happen in both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Phosphorus cycle uh, works much in the same way. Uh, plants get their phosphorus from the soil. Uh, herbivore comes by and eats the plant, gets its phosphorus, and then carnivore or omnivore comes by nibbles on the herbivore and gets its phosphorus that way. Uh, animal wastes uh, also have uh, phosphorus uh, in those as well that can be recycled. The decomposers love it and they recycle that back into the soil. Uh, all of these cycles, uh, carbon and oxygen, nitrogen and phosphorus are cycled between, again, both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, this has been part two of chapter two, Principles of Ecology.